Thank you for listening to the Luminous Recovery Yoga Podcast, hosted by Carrie Doherty. The views and opinions expressed here are strictly those of the person who gave them. Take what you like and leave the rest. These views and opinions do not represent any specific 12-step program. Only my experience, strength, and hope in recovering from the dis-ease of addiction and codependency. If you'd like to learn more, please visit my website at www dot luminous recovery yoga dot com. Hello, my friend. I'm so excited to share this week's episode of the Luminous Recovery Yoga podcast with you. This week's episode is an interview with the one and only Durga Leela, the creator of Yoga of Recovery. It's an honor to share this episode with you because we discuss Durga's incredible new book, Yoga of Recovery. Durga's book is a one of a kind guide that combines the ancient wisdom of Ayurveda with the principles of the 12 steps. The result is a powerful resource for anyone seeking healing from addiction, transformation, and renewal. Not only does this book offer valuable insights and practices for self-discovery, but it also played a pivotal role in my own journey to sobriety. In this episode, I open up about my struggles with addiction and how yoga of recovery helped me gain greater self-knowledge and ultimately transform my life. And of course, we also have the pleasure of hearing from Durga herself. Her wisdom and humor are a true inspiration. So sit back, relax, and get ready to learn from the best, Durga Leela. All right. Welcome to our uh, listeners and to people who might be joining us for this episode. I am Carrie. I am the creator of the Luminous Recovery Yoga Podcast, and I am here with my precious teacher, Durga. I have uh, been introduced to Durga through some of the work that... um, I've done with her via your online courses, but then also Durga wrote this book. I'm going to show it off here. It's a pretty book. It's called Yoga of Recovery. And I got my hands on this book pretty shortly after you uh, published it. You said, what was the publishing date? May? May 19th, 2022. That's the the birthday of the book. And I think I got this book sometime this summer and I really love it. And the opportunity to interview you for this book is very special to me. And, uh, you know, I have a lot of reverence for my teachers. So thank you for being one of my precious teachers, Durga. And um, as I was telling Durga before we hit record on this episode, I actually got sober halfway through this book. <laughs> uh, I love I've been that. in recovery, I've been wonderful. in recovery for many years, but um I wasn't ready to embrace sobriety as a part of my recovery. And as I got through this book, you know, Durga, what's really interesting is my drug of choice was marijuana and there's not a whole lot. And this is kind of interesting, especially because, you know, weed is really blowing up as a legal substance. You know, you could, I'm here in Portland, you could see a cannabis shop on every street corner, literally. And, um, And, you know, oftentimes we don't want to talk about how weed has its own pretty strong habitual tendencies. And so as I was reading your book, you started talking about cannabis (laughs) and I was like, shit, I've been avoiding this conversation. I've been avoiding the conversation that I've been wanting to have with myself for a long time about the hold that cannabis has had on me for many years. Mm -hmm. And what's interesting about cannabis is that, um, you know, oftentimes cannabis can be, um, mm, how do I say this? Maybe you can help me flesh this out, but it's pseudo spirituality. Mm -hmm. Do you, you know, where like using cannabis could be seen as part of a health movement and it could be seen as part of, uh, a spiritual drug of sorts. Um, but I can tell you that the way I was using cannabis was not spiritual and it was not mindful. And I would say that, um, there was an obsession. Mm -hmm. So I was reading this book and I get halfway through and I'll be honest, I probably read the first quarter of it actually stoned. (laughs) Yeah, of course. (laughs) And then, you know, but then you mention in the book about, uh, here it is. Let's see. I'm trying to think where I saw it in the book. Oh, it's, oh, here we go. Um, yep. You talk about the senses. This is in chapter on misuse of the senses and addiction and in fire, which you also pair with sight, eyes, and feet. 
Uh, addiction behaviors that impact the system include smoking, cigarettes, vaping, and cannabis. And I was like, oh, Durga. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, so I, you know, I want to say I actually have this book as part of my gratitude for finding sobriety because you name it, you called it out. Well, how did you relate to that as you saw it names? Because here's the thing. I don't believe the message of our addiction comes from outside of ourself. Mm -hmm. I believe it comes from a push pull strongly encoded deeper sense of self that's, Mm -hmm. you know, it's gentle and loving towards us. Right. So it's kind of saying, I see what you're trying to do here, but it's not the right way. It's not like the right solution. Maybe it worked back then. It's not working now because otherwise there would be no misery in addiction Mm -hmm. because some of these things are short term feel good. Right. Mm -hmm. But that's a little bit of the problem is the the brief covering over the brief numbing out of something that is roiling under within us. Mm -hmm. That's going on. So as you as you say all that, um, you know, and especially every conversation about is this an addiction? Because we have moved way beyond the alcohol and drugs Mm -hmm. and, you know, even. Cannabis like is it a drug because it's a herb. And so like I've hung out with like reggae stars and they're like, you know, it's the herb. And I'm like, yeah, it's the herb. And it's, it is part of certain people's religious practices and things. Mm -hmm. Even in India, you know, you always see people smoking, um, all of that. But the the book especially comes at it from a like embodied aspect of how can you, how can you maintain a mind body system that's kind of healthy and happy Um, And the thing is, a lot of the time we're not healthy and we're not happy. And so therefore we are reaching out for things. And so as I hear you say that, that's where my question is, what's the unhappiness that you're reaching out for? Because it's it's okay. People say they're using medical marijuana, right? Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. And, you know, it is my favorite thing recently is a YouTube video with Robert Svoboda and he mentions the the use of cannabis and he he says it so succinctly according to our medicine system there's three things a substance can be it can be a food it can be a medicine and it can be a poison Mm. so cannabis isn't a food right Mm -hmm. so is it a medicine or poison then it is a medicine when it is used for the proper condition in the proper dosage for the proper length of time right Right. Like any other herb. And then when you leave that and you start to use it, we would say chronically or for some kind of other need that you have, then it has the potential to start to become a poison. Mm-hmm. And it is like a poison to Alakananda Ma, who is one of the teachers in Colorado. She says it's a poison in the idea of it is having its effect on the fire aspect of the body, the pitta dosha. And it causes this kind of low level irritability. And um, she names it as kind of hasn't reached the numbers yet of, uh, you know, liver disorder type Mm -hmm. of thing. So it's, it's slowly having its effect in that system. And from our medicine system, which is a totally elemental, interconnected mind, body, consciousness, Ayurveda, life science system, then it. It does. And that manifests differently in different individuals, according to their own constitution, according to many other factors. So it given all of that, um, it also it also has an effect on the prana. So that the actual life force and vitality and that has to be in flow. Mm -hmm. Um, And that's why we all do yoga, because without even knowing about it, when you go into a yoga class, you'll get that feeling of like sort of flow, even if it's restorative, right? It doesn't have to be like power right. yoga or anything. There's just that feeling. And we are, we are that. That's what is living us, right? That prana. And so our connection to that is really important. And a lot of the a lot of the substances or behaviors that we mm-hmm. use, I I grew up in Glasgow in Scotland. So we we're used to the term loan sharks. Right. And mm-hmm. and I think I put that in the book. It's like you're feeling a little under par, 
Mm-hmm. And it's like, if you said it financially, you need a dollar to get you through the afternoon or to get you through this particular right. feeling or situation in your life. But here's these things are sitting there and they don't really give you the dollars worth. They give you five dollars worth. And so you needed a dollar. You got five dollars. So you're feeling good. But you're not remembering that, you know, maybe a week later, you're going to owe ten dollars. Mm-hmm. for that mm-hmm. for that letter there's a thing. cost for everything yeah there's a cost so and you know it's funny because what I really you know I identify and you know we're we're both in recovery so we learn to identify not compare and one of the things that I have really like I nod so vigorously when you talk about your own story because I know that you were a smoker and you talk more about your addiction to cigarettes and what like the grip that that had on you and you had asthma you had or have I know that you've uh kind of talked about your asthmatic. Um, and, and that was the thing for me is I have asthma. And so mm-hmm. every time I took a, a bong hit, it was like, I, I laugh about it now. Um, but I'd pee my pants a little, like I'd cough so much that I'd end up like weeing myself, you know? <laughs> and I was like, this is a problem. This, I don't want to be peeing on myself every time I take a bong rip, you know, but like, You know, it's interesting because I've recently had this revelation. Um, I was talking to a friend who said they had to give up sugar uh, because they were diagnosed diabetic. And I was like, oh, that's the equivalent of being an asthmatic and having to give up smoking where there's this thing that has a hold on you. And it's literally like weakening your system in serious ways. And and it really is. I mean, it it was a trusted friend, (laughs) you know, like. I feel like every time I took a bong hit, it was like I was looking for salvation at the end of that bong, at the end of that hit, and it just never came, you know? Mm -hmm. So when it crosses into the realm of medicine or poison, um, you know, I I think a lot of that also has to do with intentionality. And and I, for me, I had no intentionality anymore. It might have started out that way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Um, I'm actually in the process of reading the big book and, uh, I'm at at that part right now where it's like every addict comes to the point where they could have quit before it became a major problem. But, but that, like, I, I missed that exit, that off ramp, you know, where maybe I could have like quit at a time where it wasn't a problem, but it, it became a major problem. And I couldn't even, you know, like I'm a yoga teacher and there was a, a certain level of even shame around that for me that, you know, I, I'd be practicing next to my students and I would hear that wheeze, you know, like, mm-hmm. that. <laughs> and it was yeah. embarrassing, you know? Yeah. Um, and there's, there's a lot of that. I mean, I have a lot of yoga teachers in uh, yoga recovery, obviously yoga therapists and, you know, we're all, uh, we're all whatever we are. And so a lot of them come into yoga recovery and then after that, they'll make decisions more supportive Mm-hmm. of like who they truly authentically want to be mm-hmm. um but I think it's just it's just that process like there's one addiction process there's one disease process physical or mental health wise and then there's this like one recovery process which you're like luminous recovery it's that like making our way into the light mm-hmm. and I do believe that for some of us we're not going to go into the bright lights. We're going to edge our way towards that. So some candle light is going to help to begin with, sure. uh, which may be the conversation about harm reduction. So I like even just sitting with you, I would say, so like, why do you continue to like go use the delivery method of the bong? Why wouldn't you switch to edibles just to at least give your lungs that break? It just right? wasn't satisfied. It was the smoking. It wasn't satisfying. Yeah. Like I, yeah. I would find that um, it just didn't, if it came down to using edibles, I just was like, that's just not the thing. That's not the same. You know, Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. there was something about the flame in my hand, the fire, the, the smoke that was, you know, but it was also like, what am I really trying to escape here? You Mm -hmm. know, what am I really trying to, so I, I didn't know, you know, I, I feel like in that way, it's kind of like the addict saying, well, I'll just switch to beer and wine. Mm -hmm. Like that's how it felt for me. Like if I was just going to go find another way, it was like, I think I really just need to have a clear head. Like that's what it came down to for me was that, um, I knew that I was just misappropriating the tool. You know, a tool is a tool, right? A hammer is a hammer. You could use a hammer to 
build a house or smash every window windshield on the street, right? Like it's just the tool. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, as you use, as you talk about in the book, misuse of the senses, I was just, and that's the first time that this idea uh, has been um, uh, brought to me is this idea of misuse of the senses. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? What that means, misuse of the senses in the so context it, of addiction? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I wrote that book, uh, Yoga Recovery, and it's primarily about how we can reframe our addictiveness issues by looking at the Ayurveda system. And one of the first things to do then is what, how do they name disease? How does disease manifest? And so they say that the whole Ayurvedic system, which is the sister science of yoga, says, you know, firstly, we're in this self-forgetfulness. So we're in this state of ignorance, just like yoga says, that we are eternal beings at our very essence, which is all intelligence, that that is our true nature. But that's veiled from us under this forgetting. And then once we're in that forgetfulness, then we will have this capacity to misuse our senses. Mm -hmm. And this really was brought home to me um, like many, many times. But the one that I remember the most was my teacher, Swami Sita Ramananda, saying, um, if you continuously pursue the you know, leisure and pleasure through the senses, you're going to be increasingly imbalanced and disappointed. So there's an aspect to this. It doesn't even need to be like in any realm of addiction, like I, I now watch elderly people and their whole sense of satiation of life comes from their engagement with the senses. But what happens when you can't see as well? What happens when you can't hear as well? Or, you know, you don't have the strength of your own teeth anymore to chew and eat as much. And so like those people sort of become miserable because they can't like suck out juice from the external world of like sense, leisure and pleasure. Um, but for for people with addictions, it's to show like the way we go through those five elements, five senses, and the way it's really about how, how we're looking to resolve some inner feeling or some desire or need. And we're doing it across like what we see and what we touch and feel and what we do with our hands and what we put in our mouth, uh, all of that. Uh, and as we do that, um, like I said earlier, it gives you some short term solution or pleasure, but it may not always be the long term effect that you're really hoping for. Mm -hmm. But somehow we can't remember that again. So when that feeling arises again, we go for the same thing. So there's a lot of different reasons that that conversation is important to me because like I'm teaching yoga recovery and most people think of addiction related to alcohol and drugs. Mm -hmm. And then there's that thing, oh, does it relate to this drug or that drug, which is encouraged even at the level of the DSM, right? You know, the mm -hmm. DSM used to have uh, two, two distinctions. You would have substance abuse or substance dependency. And I often say it depends who gave you the drug. Oh. So if it was prescribed drugs, you're substance dependent. And if it was illegal drugs, you're abusing drugs. <laughs> but like from, from a holistic point of view, it's the same thing, right? right. Like you're dependent or addicted, however you want to put it, or abuse, abusive. Now we're changing that language. But also I am a person that was raised in a home that had addictions, like alcoholism, number one. And alcoholics were very, very judgmental of anyone who used drugs. Yeah. Of course, you know, I shouldn't say alcoholics. I should say <laughs> drinkers. Yeah. You know, I mean, it was appalling that someone was, you know, like it was okay to drink a bottle of whiskey, but it was not okay to smoke a joint. That was something different entirely. It was very right. dangerous. You know, and I'm being raised in Scotland. Um, where was, when was I raised? Like in the... 80s I was coming into like my adulthood to uh, be using these things and it was just amazing the the kind of difference of opinion people had even like even my young friends were kind of horrified that I would and this was interesting for someone as alcoholic as I was that I've started on 
um, smoking. You guys call it weed. In, in Britain, we would call it dope because it wasn't this grass stuff. It was like uh-huh. much stronger. And so I started on that. And yet somehow I never really felt addicted to that. But alcohol was like mm-hmm. it was instant addiction for me as soon as you gave me it. And then all these reasons of why we have these addictions. But then when I got into recovery, so I, I stopped using alcohol. I didn't stop using cannabis. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, They call my... that California sober now. Aha, uh-huh. yeah, the marijuana maintenance program. <laughs> and There's a name you know, for that. <laughs> California sober. It's, it's very true. <laughs> have you heard that? Have you heard that term? I, I had not heard that. Oh, that's um, that's the term we we millennials use. Are you are you sober sober <laughs> or are you California sober? <laughs> I love that because I came all the way to California. And that's where I got sober. And yeah, I mean, it's, it's also a totally different. It's a totally different drug from what I was used to in Europe. Um, like I say, much, much heavier is what I was doing in Europe. Um, but then. I was in my recovery and then I had to be convinced that there was a need to shift off of that crutch support system and kind of move into like a spiritual program of recovery. And Mm -hmm. there's so much to talk about in recovery because it's not a self-help program. So I personally found myself in a 12 step program and that's where I learned uh, like a a set of spiritual tools to help me do something that I really didn't think I could do on my own. And some of that was from um, like really deep felt, weird, like spiritual experiences, changes, synchronicities and things like is time, you know, there's change here. Mm-hmm. And then um, that's like the spiritual part of the program. And then there was also that group support part of the program, which was so huge. And in the process of doing that here, I'm discovering all these other like really pesky little expectations obsessions attachments behavioral um quirks that I have that are making me sort of miserable Mm -hmm. and it it goes across what I'm eating like my desire to move and exercise and sleep and you know who I'm hanging out with uh looking for relationships like the whole thing my relationships with my family it was like oh my god this is this is kind of never ending um, that I could belong to every 12 step program. And I feel then, the same way. I feel like I have to pick one because I could go to every one. And for me at the root of it, you know, I do Al-Anon as a primary program, but you know, it, for me, and, and you talk about this in our course, the, the healing, the habits that bind, and it, it just hit me in the forehead when you said it, food and people. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Our primary, and that's- our primary attachments. Yeah, that's where we get to when we're looking at the root, the root of the behaviors, like the cause, the cause. And, and that is something that holistic healing constantly wants to do is, you know, bring it into the individual so that we can be empowered in our own choices. And we're looking for not just always looking at the symptoms, but looking at the deeper causes. Mm-hmm. Um, so that aspect of the disease, when we look at it across all five senses, then I feel like we make an invitation or we like we signal to the people that have those lives of misery based around food and people and other socially acceptable acting out addictions or like behavioral disorders. Um, Like we invite them in for this conversation. And there's something about addiction which can be like, you know, it can be deadly. So it's a huge pathology. But on its way to being that, it's also sort of like it's a coping mechanism. It's a uh, it's kind of social. Like you're you're not really part of things unless you're doing certain certain right. of these I things. Mean, my in base question is like groups. What do I even do with my hands? Like where uh-huh. do I put them? You know, like if I don't have something going in my mouth, like what do I do with my hands? You know, mm-hmm. like how do I even manage this body part? <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> you know. Yeah, but it is, and that was, you know, and I know you talk a lot about process addiction as well. Yeah, yeah, and so it's it's quite the ride when you get into recovery, and then you sort of begin to see a little bit more clearly. And and at that point, I don't want to like label it addiction and that big pathological thing. So 
I do see Ayurveda as being one of the most intelligent behavioral health care mm-hmm. systems mm-hmm. because it is about, you know, not passively being cured of something that's gone wrong, but right. participating in a different way and making better choices. And it's also not on the diet, off the diet. It's, right. a, it's a continuous thing that relates to your time and your environment and your right. one constitutional of my other self. Food. And, yeah. you know, I, I've been kind of going through this lately with, you know, I'm, I'm always on and off the bus with food. Like, what am I doing? What do I eat? How much do I eat? When do I eat? Like it, this has been a lot, an ongoing life struggle for me. And yeah. in our course, healing the habits that bind, you know, this term, we've been talking about the senses and it has really opened up just my eyes to, um, taste and the, how the senses, you know, really play a role in, um, the food choices that we make. And, you know, you, we've talked a lot about sweet, the sweet taste, and that's something that you've talked a lot about. And I noticed like recently I've been eating oatmeal and I'm like, well, when I don't put sugar on the oatmeal, I still taste sweet, but I'm just so used to reaching for the sugar, mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, and, and it's really given me a new perspective on food, which is, oh, there is still a sweet taste available here. I just haven't been listening. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and and the senses are a very powerful tool, you know, when it comes to learning to regulate ourselves. Yeah, and it's kind of interesting because that's something that we are talking about is we become kind of senseless, yeah. and yet our senses are completely bombarded. You know, in in healing the habits that bind, we're talking about life is sweet, and you know, we're kind of seeing we're being assaulted by this like almost heroin level of sweet, yes. the refined heroin sugars. sweet, you call it. And, yeah. <laughs> and the, the high fructose corn syrup, you know, it's like mainlining that stuff into our veins. And so that's, that's a problem when, but when you really look at what's being amplified, it's the nature of food and the nature of food is sweet because sweet builds our body. And then there's these other tastes, sour, salty, pungent, which is spicy, Mm -hmm. uh, astringent, which is tart and then bitter. And so we actually look to have those other tastes because it's like gives you the like the symphony of the taste. Like we're constantly combining those things. But without sweet, we wouldn't be here embodied. Right. So we it is like if we say it from the like the Vedic perspective, it's our ego embodied nature that is addicted to sweet and so given that that's the case then we're being manipulated by the processed food chain because they keep adding more and more refined salt Mm -hmm. and sugar into the food to make it addictive Mm -hmm. and so therefore we we are facing not just uh you know having to muster some discipline right which is which is part of the yoga pathway it's tapas you know it's to do a little Something that makes you a little like straight. Uncomfortable. Yeah. 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 Something beyond your comfort zone and, you know, showing up to do that. And then once you do that, it becomes part of your comfort zone and then you move on from there. Uh, and that's one thing I would say about the whole teaching what I teach. It's a long term process, but it's not a grind. It's a joyful, like becoming awake process. Um, it's an empowered process. It's hopeful. And it's also like you can you can like lapse into a different level of behavior. And it doesn't mean you have to kind of like shame yourself and write yourself off because there's there's so many different aspects to our like showing up for ourselves that like if you have a a time when you've like we're we're heading into like holidays, people are going to eat a lot of things that wouldn't be their higher choice. But it's like you can go into that and then, you know, come back out of it and you don't right. have to descend into the depths of having failed. Right. So it's being a little bit more gentle with yourself. And it's it's giving yourself a fully rounded approach. Um, so like, you know, if you're eating that, then like don't eat it at night before you right. go to bed right. or, you know, get up the next day and take a walk or take a walk after you do something. So it's always kind of antidoting. So our thing is balance, right? And ba- balance looks different in different stages of your life and s- different situations. Um, and I think we can be, yeah, we can be supported in a group to understand that a little better. And you can also have uh, like an Ayurveda 
practitioner like guiding you on that like a coaching type of thing uh, is that what you say so I, I have a couple of questions and this is a good segue into um you're a yoga therapist and you also train yoga therapists right that's one of your um your offerings and so what you know what does it mean to have an ayurveda an ayurvedic practitioner guiding you or is that what yoga therapy is or can you tell us a little bit about what yoga therapy is and what that means and yeah um, so firstly, I'm trained as a Ayurvedic practitioner, and, and that's really where my own need took me. And to become an Ayurveda practitioner in the USA is a different thing than becoming a yoga therapist. Mm. So I trained in Ayurveda, and then I also took a yoga teacher's training course. That was back in 2001 to 2003. I completed that part of my studies. And then I was only doing this to reach people on a recovery pathway and what I wanted to do was add all these different component parts of like what I felt was needed to keep me balanced on my recovery path so I um I then applied yoga as I was being taught it through the four paths into the um how we could use those for recovery and then that has since become a yoga therapy field and so yoga therapy wow. is where we take the practices of yoga and we apply them to improve or create more balance on an individual's physical, mental and emotional needs. Mm -hmm. Whereas a yoga practice in and of itself is to move us towards self-realization. Right. You know, that's the spiritual pathway. Um, and so these intersecting uh, like we have intersecting identities and we also have these intersecting like aspects of what a system can do for you. So you can use yoga as, you know, it will help you with your um, sore knee. It will help you with your anxiety. Right. Mm -hmm. And then you can also use yoga to sort of transcend some of those more mundane tendencies towards behavior that's going to bring you into increased imbalance uh, with a view to like really experiencing the the clarity of mind the peace of mind and an aspect of like just loving compassion like as a as a a choice in your daily life yeah so ending the struggle kind of with the 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 how, how could I say that lower choices that that more reactionary stress personality that a lot of us right. have and then the stuckness that comes from that like our own self-judgment sometimes is that stuckness so a, a way into more freedom and peace so that's so is that's that how yoga, yoga recovery was born was your you know, you noticed in the field that something was, at least for you, something was missing, that there was some connection to be made there between what you were learning in Ayurveda and what you knew from your, your 12 step path. Yeah. And, and so you're really a, a forefront pioneer, um, in, in blending together yoga and Ayurveda, or I'm sorry, um, recovery, 12 step work in Ayurveda. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, two words to describe that piece of my work, which is just recovery embodied, because mm. I, I thought it was it was interesting that if I was sitting in a therapist office, I was doing the kind of psychological talk right. therapy. And then I was also on a mat doing my yoga practice. I had even done that as a practicing alcoholic smoker addict, right. all of that. And then um, I was sitting in. A recovery pathway mine being 12 steps and it was telling me I'm using a set of spiritual tools so it's telling me to pray and meditate mm -hmm. and so I kind of get that I, I was raised in a religion I was practicing yoga on the mat I was in a spiritual program I was in talk therapy and yet for me my my body was left behind I mean there was the there was the aspect on the mat but that's where like I'm about to teach in April, April next year, May. Mm -hmm. uh, between the mat and the meeting is what my, my work is called. Because yeah, and what tell us more about that. What what would people expect to find or learn in in that course? Yeah, well, that course is kind of about just what you were saying. 
this was me having found this embodied practice, sister science of yoga. And then it's like, oh my God, this, this so fits what I now need. And I often say I had the hunger that food wouldn't take away and the tiredness that sleep wouldn't remove. And I had all these relational difficulties. And the number one relationship that I was really struggling with is who am I? Like wow. having escaped from my emotional feelings and needs and that for so many years, like here I am left without all of those things. And like, who am I underneath all that? So the Ayurveda constitutional model really helped me there says everyone is a manifestation of all five elements. And because we have a different dominance of different elements within us, that's why you see us in all shapes and sizes. Mm. You know, we have different eyes, different hair, different frames, different metabolisms and different like stress points with environment. Mm -hmm. Like some people suffer more when it's cold. Some people suffer more when it's hot, right? Um, Cold, damp, uh, wet weather, like maybe like more like you have in Portland or Seattle, Glasgow, definitely. That would tend to imbalance like the water types more than it would say the fire types, for instance. So Every interaction you're having is is playing up against your constitution. So my thing with that was I was over it trying to make myself better at that scientific media advice level that's based on one size fits all. Mm -hmm. That really wasn't working for me. And I think as we're now in this 21st century, people are beginning to reclaim like, you know, like body positive and stuff right. like that. To right. me, 20 years ago, are you being It's never been a better time that. to be chubby. Like when I was young and I, I needed a new outfit, that was like, well, I'll go to the Gap and buy a pair of boys pants. And that was humiliating. Like as a young uh-huh. girl to have to go always to the boys section because I was husky. Nobody yes. wants, nobody feels good in, in that situation. And yeah. nowadays you yeah. can walk into almost, I, I'm telling you, I was at the mall recently and I was walking past like, one of those like cute popular stores that I would have died to fit into those clothes back in high school. And the, mm-hmm. the, um, the model on the, um, you know, the advertisement at the front of the store had stretch marks. And I was like, Oh my God, <laughs> you know, like we've changed, <laughs> yeah. you know, and, and thank God, you know, but I, I, and, but I also got to say, no matter how much virtue signaling the corporations are making towards us, they're still the people that cause the problem in the right. first place. Absolutely. Right. And so I, I have no trust for them. Every time I see them doing it, I'm just like, look at them claiming our awakening. Right. And, and selling it to us Ooh, again. Claiming our right. awakening and selling it back to us. Like, look, yeah. at what, look at how nice we are to put this, <laughs> you know, it's, it's really, yeah, it's, it's maddening. Yeah, I mean, it's like they're they're trying to kind of like buy into our revolution. And I would say like, you know, if it's a real revolution, get rid of them. You know, they have all their products made in China and, you know, other places where there are no labor rights and stuff. And the shareholders reap those profits, but they don't put them back into our communities. So find your local store, you know, that's I, I think I saw something about that the other day, you know, like the. Um, like the Giving Tuesday and that is just like mm-hmm. give locally, give to the people that are a face in your right. neighborhood um, and look at the labels, you know. Mm-hmm. So that that's a big thing for me because the, the biggest vote that we have is with our dollar. And it's really true. I yeah. was thinking about something you said. I actually repeated it to my dad today when we were talking. And you said, uh, you said people are really afraid to join cults, but nobody talks about joining the cult of capitalism. <laughs> Mm-hmm. You and said that, right? I feel right? Like you yeah, said that I in our last it. session. You you <laughs> talked about the cult of capitalism and the cult of consumerism, and nobody wants to admit that they've joined a cult. Yeah, mm-hmm. but here we are. Yeah, you know, and, and that's I, I that's, that's directly to, related to the devotional aspect of yoga. That's what we were talking about. Um, and because we want to kind of drop that need to be the individual, and so need to be like seen. Uh, and then become one of the many. And the one of the many is unity principle in amongst the diversity. And so all of these things are to be navigated. Uh, 
So like, I'm going back to between the mat and the meeting in case anybody's still listening and thinking, is she going to say what that's about? So the, the name of that comes from the fact that I did have, I had a therapist meeting that, you know, it was a means tested therapy that I was in so I could afford it. Mm-hmm. Um, because one of my things about being here in America was I didn't have health insurance. And so a lot of the scientific media, all those MRIs, PET scans, rehabs that they're all talking about, that's that's not within most of our rich folk capacity, <laughs> right? Yeah, 10, 10%, percent of people that need rehab are going to get rehab, right? And so I never went to a rehab, um, and then so I was in a meeting, I was in a therapist meeting, and I was on the mat, but I was really struggling what, with what I call the other twenty two hours of the day, right? Mm-hmm. So um, in the daytime, like something's wrong with me I'm standing in front of the fridge looking into my fridge thinking I'm hungry I shouldn't be hungry I want to eat something what can I possibly eat what's right for me I don't know and then you know sitting on the couch feeling really tired because I don't sleep well at night beating myself up that I'm supposed to be out there doing some kind of aerobics cardio exercise (laughs) whilst I'm smoking and trying to recover from like years of abuse on my body mind system and you know childhood traumas like the the ace stuff right Right. and so I was I was kind of left to my own devices there and what you said to begin with I totally agree with that these teachers began to show up in my path and I think you know when the students ready the teachers do appear Mm -hmm. and I was really gifted with the science of Ayurveda and that's what between the mat and the meeting is and that's what that book is mostly about Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. And, and then I have this other piece of work, which is the six tenets of yoga recovery, healing the habits tenets. that bind. And then what am I doing there? I'm trying to look at who we actually are. And then those ways, like I, I call them pitfalls, mm. that we kind of reach out to like coping mechanisms, resolve our stress and pain and hurt. And it starts to become problematic and where yoga meets us in that. So those six tenets are life is longing because we do seek back for source for the, 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 like the eternal resolution from all these hearts and pains. Mm-hmm. And then life is prana because we do seek vitality. And then life is relationship because it's impossible to live outside of relationships. We're constantly in relationship. And then life is sweet because we will self-soothe using our senses and it doesn't have to be self-destructive. It can feel really good and it can be very constructive and positive. And then life is love, mainly because that's what we seek mostly. You know, we kind of seek the love and approval of ourselves and others. And then life is progress. So all of those are different ways that we're manifesting these like deep needs and then where I think in some sense, we have the capacity to act out and have the need, but not get the needs met because it's the inappropriate um, tool that we're reaching for or solution. Uh, And then um, you you refer to uh, marijuana as your drug of choice. And that's Mm -hmm. one of the things we're talking about in yoga of recovery is it's not really a drug of choice. It's a distraction of choice. Right. 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 And, because, you know, I think about like what my therapist calls it is my existential craving. It's yeah. mm-hmm. the, because there's mm-hmm. really nothing at the bottom of that puff or in the fridge or on the TV. Like it's really not there, that thing that I'm searching for. And, you know, what I've really gotten out of my work with you is that it is a spiritual disease. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It is a spiritual unrest. And, yeah. um, and that there's just gotta be a, like a deeper solution because it's, it's not, I'm not, you know, I, I do the same thing. I look into the fridge, like, what are you looking for in there, Carrie? What do you think is going to come? You know, <laughs> it, it's just, it's not there, uh-huh. you know? Yeah. And but uh, we are sold constantly a material solution. Absolutely. So, like a physical material solution. And this is where yoga really needs to step up and be who we truly are, especially at a therapeutic level, that we work with a Western medical model that is based in like the chemical reality of the biochemical system, right? Mm -hmm. 
But in yoga, we are thoroughly trained on the more subtle level, just like traditional Chinese medicine. Mm -hmm. They have chi, we have prana. And so the more subtle aspect is the less physical, less tangible. And we can use the physical and tangible. Ayurveda is a science of that. And then it meets its sister science of yoga at the more subtle level, like different poses for the body, different breath techniques, different ways to train the mind and into concentration and focus and flow. And so that we're not, you know, we become the master of our mind. Right, right. And so those are those are more subtle tools. And then they are part of like our our deeper, more essential, eternal nature, which is the spirit aspect. Um, so I think sometimes I want to say subtle rather than spiritual, because sometimes the spiritual brings up this idea of like, if you're scared of a cult, you're definitely scared of, you've been scared off of religion, right? You know, some kind of dogmatic thing, then you don't want it to be any part of it. So like we're going into in January, I'll start teaching two more of the tenants, which is life is prana and life is progress. And one of the things that I like to do is how can you reframe the God aspect, which is the spiritual aspect of healing, into something that is like palatable to people, mm -hmm. accessible. So in Life is Prana, we call it in, in 12 steps, they call it a higher power or God. Uh -huh. And so for Life is Prana, which is the vital life force, we say, OK, it's a healing power or it's um, healthy prana. That's our HPs mm. or it's God, which is the great outdoors mm. because, you know, nature is full of prana. And right. so people hear that and they're like, OK, I'm good with that. I'm good with the fact that I can be healed out there as nature and nature can be my God. Right. Um, and that moves us off from that, like a lot of people struggling with those great philosophical questions about God and religion and spirituality and all that because one of the things that really got me in the first part um, of our tenant work was um, you said, Oh, great, someone's mowing the lawn outside. I don't know if you can hear it. I can't. <laughs> oh, great. Um, you said, You know, what is it that you most long for? Make that, make that your God, make that your practice. And that just really. Wow, that was something that just really like shifted my thinking in terms of what mm -hmm. am I really looking for? What am I really yeah. longing for? And you yeah. know, that's why the work of this the tenants have been so healing um, for me. And so, you know, I want people to know who might be listening to this that there's still an opportunity to get involved uh, even before this episode will be released. So there will still be time to sign up for the last two tenets of life is progress and life is prana. Yeah, so we're going to be doing that live from the 30th of January through to the 27th of March. And there's a lot of pre-recorded stuff on the course platform. And then there's seven live sessions where we get mm -hmm. together. And then on top of that, there's twice a week live sessions that are um, recovery meetings and book discussions. So there's a different way of combining all of this. So the, the people I'm training as yoga therapists mm -hmm. have come in and people in recovery come in and you have all these different levels of participation. If you wanted to uh, come to every session, sometimes you can be four times a week in class with us. Mm -hmm. And that's good for people that need that initial support that, right. you know, maybe they are feeling isolated and cut off or just really need to touch in to a group of people that understand what they're going through. And then there's our yoga therapists and sometimes they are the same people yoga teachers and other therapists that I'm training and they're coming in to get like this broader perspective on like another healing aspect right, for people right. because we we need to offer people like the dignity of choice around how they're going to approach their own health and wellness mm -hmm. um I think that that's a big part and this one is it, it you can work with it in many many different ways so you can be taking medications to help you with your mental health and addictiveness and using yoga recovery. Right, you right, know, right. Um, you can be on a recovery pathway, any recovery pathway. And many of our people are not on a recovery pathway. Um, so there's all different combinations and permutations of the group of people that we are. Um, and I think the one thing is, is 
I still find it difficult to really explain what yoga recovery is. So hence, that's funny. That was one of my questions. Durga, what is yoga of recovery? (laughs) And so then that's when I say it's not, so it's not a 12 step program. It's not a yoga class. It's not an opinion on drug policy, right? It's none of those things. Uh, And then the best thing I can say is a complete reframing of the problem Mm -hmm. and solution. Mm -hmm. According to the Vedic perspective, thereby leading us into a lived solution, uh, which is about recovery embodied and which is about taking that inherent addictiveness that many of us are living, that one addiction process, and being able to admit to where we are with that without shame or stigma or that pathological lifetime label. Right. And then finding a way to resolve it like over time for whatever suits our needs. Uh, And for that, some people join us when they're 20 years on a recovery pathway and they still find a lot of help. And some people are like, I was in a meeting with our groups the other day and probably about 60% of that group were within their first year of abstinence. Mm -hmm. Um, Even some people that are 20 years abstinence are still in their first year of abstinence from something else. Right. So this addiction interaction and all that is what we're dealing with. So when I say all of that, um, the two things that I want to like people listening, like my attempt to have this conversation reach our like grassroots communities, because we can't wait for the experts to solve this for us, whether it's the opiate crisis or the daily misery that's being caused by that food and people addictiveness, mm-hmm. right? Um, like we need to just get out into our societies and start having conversations that are like creative and accessible and welcoming to everyone at whatever level of suffering that they're at. So the book is supposed to be uh, a way to reach a wider circle of people. Right. Yeah. And then to get on with us live, we have that second Saturday. So I was going to bring to register people who are listening to this, even if you're not ready to commit to say the whole uh, session, you could come and join us for second Saturdays, which um, is, donation based and you can basically get a taste of what we're studying yeah yeah in the, in the tenants and those people in the course it's about bring your friends then right you know because that's it's it's another thing that I think technology is doing to us is where we're all in front of our own screen and even this disease it says it's them and us you know there they are in recovery and here right. we are we're untouched by this but that's not true you know, we're all part of this one addiction process. And it's it's good to share that as well. Like, you know, most rehabs know that they need to have a, a family program. They need to have an alumni right, program. Right, right. And the yoga recovery program is just pretty much 12 months of the year. We're offering some form of recovery support, relapse support, you know, a long-term emotional sobriety support. Like mm-hmm. if we're is a whole range of people that are participating. Uh, so the, the book and the second Saturday, so the second Saturday, 2023, mm-hmm. is the 14th of January, the 11th of February, and the 11th of March. And That's the ones also, that I can remember. Um, people could find you on Instagram at Yoga of Recovery. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And you, my website is yogaofrecovery.com. Yogaofrecovery.com. I'll show everyone yeah. the book one more time. It's called Yoga of Recovery. Um, and, uh, you know, if you get the book and you love it, leave a, a review for Durga on Amazon. Cause that helps, that helps, you know, helps the algorithms <laughs> and yeah, it does, uh, helps get the it? word out there. I, I seriously need to help there. Um, because I'd never put much money into promotion. My, my thing is let's just go Attraction do it rather than promotion. Uh-huh. Anyway, yeah. Right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I, I have serious questions about the people that are running the social media. So I I'm, do. Yeah. I'm reluctantly involved in that. And my, my I know when they said uh, that assistant does it for me a few months ago, or I don't know, last year when they said, you know, like Facebook and Instagram is having a major effect on teenage girls. I was like, teenage <laughs> girls. I'm 36 years old. I'm dying out here. Like it's yeah. not just, you know, and you know, God bless the children, but also God bless us middle-aged adults who are also just out here feeling absolutely inadequate. 
yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. So I think that really it, it's an affliction at any age. And um, it's an affliction. And when you look at the roots of where it came from, it doesn't, you know, the means are inherent in the end. Um, right. So you should watch those, uh, those movies about what was it that they, um, social structure or social networks or something and yeah you know the very the very start of Facebook itself was all about what they now accuse it of causing right um you know so we all feel like incomplete and you know not enough and it, it does really play on that so yeah it, it does some good things but yeah so I'm gonna make uh, sure to put in the show notes and if you're watching this on YouTube I will put it in the description I will make sure to link uh, the different ways you can find Durga through social media, through Durga's website. I'll also put a link for the book so that people could just find it. Um, and then there will also be a PDF available um, in the show notes and on the description that just talk about all of the different offer- opportunities that are currently coming up so that you could work with Durga, whether you join us for Second Saturday or you decide to join us for all of uh, the the last two tenants, which is life is progress, life is prana. I'll be in there. So if you want to join, uh, that would be great. And then also you said April is when we start uh, the mat and the meeting between the mat. Yeah, and the bet- between the mat and the meeting, which is Ayurveda for our addictiveness. Awesome. And so Are you that, running a yoga goes therapy in. training program this year as well? I, I'm on faculty for oh, okay. several different um, accredited yoga therapy schools. So Soul of Yoga in San Diego, Inner Peace Yoga Therapy, which is out of Colorado, but teaches everywhere. And then the Shivananda Yoga Health Education Training and then the Integral Yoga Therapy. You're a busy gal. Four of them. Yeah, I I teach the Ayurveda part. So Ayurveda is taught in yoga therapy. I see. And then also I teach yoga recovery for lots of them, too. Yeah. And are you available if people, uh, do you do one-on-one sessions if people wanted to see you as, um, you know, a practitioner, an Ayurveda practitioner, is that something that you also do? So I favor those people who are in course in and program. session with mm-hmm. me and, um, just really right now with the amount of teaching that I'm doing, I'm, I'm not available for one-on-one, but I'd be happy to hear from anybody that wants any level of connection or help because, after 20 years of doing this and all my students, people like yourself, Carrie, mm-hmm. like it's like, who are you? Where are you? What are you looking for? Because we're a whole hub of people. Mm-hmm. And so w- we can connect you to the sort of people that will you will feel comfortable. You will right. feel invited. You know, you'll feel at home and welcomed and you'll have that Wonderful. sense of belonging. And I think that's a big first step. Yeah. And I also tell people about this yoga of recovery journey that it's also for people who are recovery curious. Like maybe you haven't found recovery yet and maybe you're not sober yet. And maybe like I I went to a a marijuana anonymous meeting and you know how people are in the rooms are like, I'm so grateful. I'm so grateful. I'm so, and I literally got on there and I was like, I'm not fucking grateful. I just want to be really clear. (laughs) I am not grateful. I am not happy. (laughs) <laughs> I'm very angry to be here. So, you know, um, and that's with years of recovery in other areas, you know, like, like we we recover in layers, you know? So, mm-hmm. um, yeah, you know, even if you're listening to this and you're not in recovery, but you're recovery curious, you know, I truly believe we all have something to recover from. And, uh, you know, my personal definition of recovery is calling your spirit back. And I think that we've all left our spirit in people, places, things, and situations that, you know, we lost a part of ourselves. And so I think that there's always something that we can call back home, a part of our spirit to be called back home. Yeah. So now you make me laugh because when I started, my first ever meeting was Al Anon. uh And I gave that a try for a while because I was raised with an alcoholic mother Mm -hmm. and it was heartbreaking and and I, I turned very rebellious and hateful over that circumstance. Mm-hmm. And I would just sit in those Aladon meetings and I was in my mid-20s at that point. And all I could hear my voice say is just leave. <laughs> just like people talking about being living with alcoholics and that had been my solution, just leave. Yeah. But there, whatever you go, there you are. Absolutely. <laughs> so Absolutely. You, you, It'll you find have, you. It'll yeah, find you. you. It goes with you is this conditioning, you know, the early childhood stuff. It's like you can't, you know, we call it it in the the rooms pulling a geographic. I mean, I've moved across the country at least twice thinking that every it's going to be different this time. (laughs) 
<laughs> that was that was my big one. I moved yeah. from London to America, Lake Tahoe of all places, because I needed a break. You know, yeah. some people would say to me, "Like, what made you come here?" It's like I needed a change. Yeah, and, but uh, you know, my personality came with me. So hence, nine absolutely. months after absolutely. my move, I, I got into recovery. Yeah. So yeah, anybody listening to this who's not yet in recovery, there is also a place for you here as well. So. Durga, and the eating disorders was, as well. And people, eating disorders. People I mean, forget about that. Yeah, absolutely. Mm-hmm. And process addictions and, you know, all of the different things, yeah. that, you know, that existential craving, wherever it comes yeah. from. Mm-hmm. Um, this conversation has been so fun. I, I just truly and deeply appreciate your time and you sharing uh, so generously with us. Yeah, it's my favorite thing to do. And I'm really glad you're with us in the group. Um, that's another thing favorite thing to do and I want to say it's not just a course a lot of the people that are in the sessions have done the course and then it's just this continuous participation yeah Um, so like there's this like process of learning and layers and more will be revealed so we're we're catering to that because I'm not keen on the yoga world and the counting of hours you know right right. Um, I think I think our best self comes when we're in a community and a support that offers these opportunities for the structure of education, but also the participation of that lived experience. So we learn so much from each other and right. we just get, we get to be useful for each other. Right. I feel and like a so, baby, to be honest, I feel like a baby in the group. Often people will be like, Oh, I've been working with Durga for, I'm like, wow. Like I'm just a old first timer here taking it for the first time, you know, Yeah. <laughs> but it's true. There are so many people in the course who have been through, you know, your courses multiple times. And, and it really actually says a lot about you as a teacher, I think as well, that people, um, people stick with you and that there's something it, to, to come out. If, it, if it says something about me as a teacher, it's because me as a teacher is me as a student is me as a yes. person in recovery. Yes. Like those intersecting identities are coming. Yes. Like I'm coming to those teachings. I'm coming to those meetings to recover, to learn, yes. to share, yes. to be part of like, so I have the same um, goal as hopefully, the people joining us. And so therefore that's a good thing. Right. I love that Durga. I really love that. I teach from that same place. Like I believe as a teacher, my most important um, position is as student. Like, so yeah. I'm teaching as student where it's like, no teaching actually just gives me permission to stay a student. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah, I love that. Mm-hmm. So thank you so much for your time. This is wonderful. I will make sure that everyone has everything they need to find you and, uh, you know, join us for any opportunity. And I just have to say, um, you know, get to know Durga because it has been really amazing um, studying with you. And I look forward to our next session in January. And, and uh, I'll, I'll say this in January, we will be out in India because another thing that I really felt the need to bring to this field was actual physical treatment. Mm. So once a year right now, possibly twice a year from next year, we will take a group of people out to India and you'll go through the Ayurveda Panchakarma process mm. at any stage in your recovery, three months, six months into like stability if you're alcohol and drug addicted. But like if you once you're signed on to these courses, that's part of it as well. So another aspect for people listening, because it's been nice to hear you say like this sober curious, you know, mm-hmm. um, but also the, the people who have um, just the kind of chronic lifestyle disorders. You're also welcome because a lot of that kind of centers into this. Like you wouldn't say addictiveness, but like rutted bad um, right. habits that right. we find so hard I to get I have another of. teacher who says overcommitment is an addiction. I mean, just the, you <laughs> yeah. know, so those of us who are constantly overcommitted, those of us yeah. who are, you know, we're the yes man, like anybody can ask us anything and we say yes. Like there's an addiction, you know, that perfectionism addiction, yeah. like it's, yeah, like even just um, the rigor of living in modern society really takes yeah. a toll. Yeah, and the stress. So that that aspect is there's this thing that I really want people to hear is a continuum of care. Mm -hmm. So I will be online. I will be on site in Bahamas in May and in uh, an ashram at the end of April. 
Uh, so you'll be able to come and be live with us and be in practice. And then this this retreat in India that you'll be invited to is three weeks or four weeks where you get on a massage table every day and take this body treatment and do a kind of like detox that's not for alcohol and drugs detox. I always have to say that it's the idea of the um you know, chemical and hormonal and metabolic rebalancing so that we can at least metabolize some of the things that's being thrown at us in our daily lives. And it's an, it's an amazing boost. Of, that's a goal like, I have regen- is to, is to go to India yeah. with you sometime or to come yeah. and do a punch of karma cleanse with you. It's, it's on my list of, um, it's on my list. And and the list happens. That's that's partly what I w- wanted to bring up was mm-hmm. I've met people on retreat, I've met people online, and then eventually we're all participating, whether it's online, whether it's mm-hmm. on site, whether it's in India. So over time, probably, if you set your intention, all of that will happen. Yes, right? yes. And I've been doing it for 20 years. So I just want you to know that I'm just going to continue doing it. And then people like my assistants that are coming up and being trained, they're also going to continue on with this because I won't be doing it forever. Right. Thank you so much for your work, Durga. You are a, thank you, Carrie. You are a a true scholar and um, an incredible person to be with on this journey of recovery. So thank you for the work, your work you're doing and for being a pioneer of this work. And, uh, and we need you in this world. So thank you. Yeah. And and congratulations uh, on your um, shift. Thank you. Thank you very much. You. So, uh, all right. Thanks everybody for listening and, uh, we'll, uh, see you later. Thank you, Carrie and everyone. Thank you for listening to the luminous recovery yoga podcast. If you'd like to support the show, please consider joining my Patreon or leaving a comment and review. If you're listening on Apple podcasts or YouTube.